Okay, and now I'm going to admit all. It's like the beat. I think give me one. There. I'm just waiting for a couple people to get into the waiting room. Okay, looks good. Hi everybody, I am Dr. Jen Collins. I'm director of the School of Education. I wanna welcome everybody to the second in the series of race and the criminal justice system. Uh, tonight's topic is going to be the legacy of mass incarceration on communities of color. So tonight um, we're gonna be discussing and providing an understanding of mass incarceration and the impacts of communities of color. We're gonna start with a history of mass incarceration starting from emancipation to the 21st century then we'll move on to the impacts of mass incarceration and what the, those impacts have on families, specifically with adverse childhood experiences or ACE scores. And then we're gonna finish with a conversation around systemic racism and the creation of the school to prison pipeline. Um, our guests tonight, our guest speakers tonight, I wanna to introduce them really quickly. Dr. Frank King is an associate professor in ethnic studies and an executive director in the Division of Diversity and Inclusion. His talk is entitled Mass Incarceration in the United States. Dr. Annette Kuhlman teaches sociology on the UW Platteville Baraboo campus. Uh, she grew up in Germany and her background is in race and ethnic relations, stratification and sociological theory. And her talk is entitled The Impact of Mass Incarceration on Families and Communities. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Adina Haslauer. She is an assistant professor in the School of Education, and she's been at UW Platteville since 2001 and has taught a variety of courses, more recently classes in multicultural education and human development. And her talk is entitled School to Prison Pipeline. A few guidelines and reminders, um, if, even if you were with us last time, a few reminders to everybody, this forum will be recorded and you can contact Travis Nelson at the end of this if you would like a copy of that recording. Uh, due to the large number of participants, questions should be asked in the chat function, please. Those will come to me and I will choose some of those to be shared at the end. Um, please make sure you're asking questions rather than stating comments. And uh, due to time constraints, it's not gonna be possible for me or the panelists to get to all the questions. Um, so those that are written really clearly uh, will be given preferential treatment. And if you do ask a question, if you are a student, will you please include your name academic year and major. And if you are a community member, could you please provide your location and your position if that is relevant. Any questions or concerns afterwards, please direct those to Dr. Travis Nelson. A few reminders and expectations. Please treat this space with civility and respect. Listen with curiosity and a willingness to learn. And please take the time to reflect and engage on the different viewpoints, especially those with which you disagree. I think we are ready. Yep. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. King. I'm going to let him begin. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Collins. So I am going to talk about mass incarceration in the United States. Uh, just one second. I'm trying to clear out some things. All right. Here we go. So this is something that could take an entire semester to cover. So I'm going to try to do it within the, the 12 to 13 minute time frame. So uh, I will also supply some resources for you to look at towards the end of the presentation. That would be very helpful if you want further research or further information. So this is something that is not as hidden as what it should be or as it is what we think, but the United States has the largest prison population in the entire world with over 2 million people. Uh, the United States has 5% of the world population, but 25% of the uh, world's prison population. And we have the highest rate of 737 per 100,000 people. 
Now, if we look at it and we break it down, we see that the majority of people are incarcerated by state prisons. Uh, we have federal prisons and the majority of people in federal prisons are uh, for drug cases. So when people talk about the war on drugs, uh, this is one of the problems that people see. But we look through state prisons, we see that oftentimes that violent perpetrators, property theft, uh, public order, but drug uh, arrests and drug, drug incarceration is not the largest out of this. But a lot of uh, these uh, other uh, prospects are part of the uh, increase of drug uh, incarceration uh, or drug related in some form or fashion. This is something that is kind of really interesting that we spend more money per inmate than we do per student. So if you look here, the cost per student per state is drastically lower than the cost per inmate in the United States. We, so therefore we are spending much more on incarcerating than we are on our education system. So we look at the past. Uh, the growth or the, the growth of the mass incarceration in the United States is, is relatively new since the 1980s. If we look at between 1925 and 1980, it's usually less than 200,000, but it grows significantly. And all these are related to the growth of the war on drugs. Uh, started in the 1970s with Richard Nixon and uh, increased tenfold under Ronald Reagan. And currently we, right now, we have between two and 2.2 .2 million people incarcerated in the United States. So one of the things that we can look at when connecting this to race is that if you're poor, you're gonna get incarcerated. The likelihood of you getting incarcerated is much higher than if you're wealthy. And if you are a person of color, the uh, likelihood of you getting incarcerated is much higher uh, particularly for Blacks and Latinos, than if you are white. So we look at mass incarceration right now, the cost is over $80 billion per year. Uh, one kind of interesting fact is that if we use this to look at uh, free college and tuition for all uh, college students, it would be around the same cost. Um, prior to incarceration, the median income for all people who, all men who were incarcerated was around 19,000. Uh, working the minimum wage for uh, 40 hours a week is around $15,000 per year. Uh, for women, it's 13,000, so that's definitely below minimum wage. Uh, boys in the bottom 10%, uh, that's the 10% lowest economic, uh, social economic status, are 20 times more likely to be in prison than those at the top 10. So we can see there's a correlation with poverty and we'll see there's a correlation with race and with a, when it comes to incarceration. So we look at the likelihood of uh, for being incarcerated for all men, it's one in nine, all women is one in 56. But we look at whites compared to black and Latino, it's a very higher proportion for black and Latino, especially for blacks. Uh, for uh, for women and for men. Uh, and one of the most surprising statistic and the shocking statistic that should be shocking for us is that understanding that uh, one in three black men have a likelihood to be in prison sometime in their lifetime. But in relation to our prison population, we can see that blacks are 12% of the population, as you can see right here. Uh, this is from the Pew Research Center, 12% uh, uh, of the black uh, population is black in the United States, but they make up 33% of the prison population. For, his, uh, for Hispanic, it's 16%, and they make up 23. But for white, they are 63% of the population, but make up only 30% of the prison population. So you see there's some, a lot of disproportionality when it comes to incarceration. So, how do people interpret this? Well, this is what racists would say versus the truth. Okay. So racists would say that it's uh, aspect of genetics, saying that blacks would commit more crime. 
or some people would say that it's a cultural aspect. Uh, they bring up the idea of single parents, they bring up the idea of hip hop in some ways, they bring up the idea of just, it's a cultural aspect. Uh, and also the idea of, of blacks not wanting to work or the lack of work ethic. So all these things have come in. Uh, in the past, and even still today, people say it's a genetic trait of inferiority. So you have biological racism and you have cultural racism that comes into play of trying to rationalize this. But here's the truth. You have poverty, you have lack of jobs, and you have a lack of education that are major factors in causing people to commit crimes. But there's also a targeting on people, particularly people of color, specifically black and brown, that are that is uh, increases the likelihood of them being incarcerated. Um, and so that's what I said here. All right, so let's go to a history about this because I want to show you that there's a connection with the history along with this. Uh, before slavery ended, the American population uh, prisons was relatively small. Uh, it was mostly like stealing, public drunkenness, uh, people getting into debt. And so uh, they were mostly uh, free blacks and immigrants. Uh, in the North, you had Irish, Italian, Polish immigrants that were uh, policed heavily. And so they were also being incarcerated in the North. But then as, after this, the prison population boomed. And after slavery, uh, it was a huge increase. In the North, you had penitentiaries that focused on Blacks and immigrants, uh, trying to police them and make sure that they stayed in their place, so to speak. And then in the South, you had the idea of convict leasing, a replacement for slaves. So these uh, plantation owners didn't have their slaves anymore, so they oftentimes would work with the state to ensure that they had a labor supply. So they created all these crazy laws that were done to attack uh, Blacks in the South. Vagrancy, meaning that you could just be sitting down or hanging out in the street uh, or the sidewalk talking to your friends, and they would say you were under arrest for vagrancy, and they would give harsh sentences, up to 10 years for some, maybe even longer. Uh, in some states, particularly Mississippi was, was one, you had to be employed if you were black. So if you weren't employed, therefore you can be punished and arrested. Uh, there were also unwritten rules of looking a, a, a white person in the eye. Uh, that was looked at as, as an offense in some places, but also you had economic competition, meaning if I had an apple cart on one street and a white person had an apple cart on the other side of the street, then that would be his competition and that person, would, could, I could get actually arrested for that. And then we have the 13th Amendment. And the 13th Amendment has a clause. Uh, so the 13th Amendment, Amendment abolished slavery, but then it also has this clause. It says, except for a uh, uh, punishment for a crime. And we also have the Eighth, Eighth Amendment, which talks about the cruel and unusual punishment. And these were violations of the Eighth Amendment, but uh, there was no federal enforcement of this. And those states really didn't care about the Eighth Amendment when it comes to harsh punishment. And so here's some examples. Uh, these are chain gangs that were used to build railroads. They were used in farms. They were used in factories in the South, mines. And a lot of people died. Uh, they also oftentimes uh, incarcerated children and threw them in, in, in this to uh, be a part of the system. So these kids were essentially part of the system and, and they were in jail for multiple, multiple years. And there was a motto because a lot of these folks died because uh, when it came to slavery, slaves were property. So the, uh, the idea was at least keeping your slave alive because that was part of your property. But also you had uh, after slavery, you had, I don't care whether they live or die. So they were put in harsh, harsh punishments and harsh conditions, very lack of food. The work conditions were terrible. And the model was, if one dies, get another. Uh, this is an example of a punishment uh, used for convict leasing. Uh, this person could have been trying to escape or, or anything. It could have been anything. And it was looked at as a setting example. So when it comes to a violation of the Eighth Amendment, we can see here that this is uh, cruel and unusual punishment. 
So bringing this today, what do we see? So we see there's uh, a lot of racial disparities uh, that uh, those races that would use, say, genetics or cultural aspects would be ways of, uh, of reasons for uh, larger incarceration of Blacks. We can see here that uh, Blacks are nationally, this is the ACLU study, Blacks are nationally three times more likely to be arrested for marijuana than whites. And so this is one particular case, uh, uh, t type of crime. Uh, and we can see that uh, places in the Midwest, Iowa, Minnesota, and Illinois, and Wisconsin are among the highest in the entire country when it comes to arresting, uh, arrest, arresting disproportionality when it comes to marijuana use. Uh, Blacks, Native Americans, and Latinos are more likely to be arrested. Uh, they are more likely to be conv convicted, and they do receive longer sentences than their white counterparts for even the same crime. Same with capital punishment, they are more likely to be uh, put in, uh, receive death penalty cases than their white counterparts for the same type of crime. This is one that I thought that was really interesting. This is from a 2003 study that talks about uh, uh, criminals and getting out and getting jobs. And so if you're a white person with a criminal record, you have a higher probability of receiving ca callbacks after a job interview than a black person without a criminal record. So we can talk about white privilege, and this is one of the prime examples that we can look at and say there is uh, an aspect of privilege uh, pertaining to getting any type of job or anything along those lines. And what happens when it comes to prison labor today? Because we do have a significant amount of prison labor today. Uh, there's a high probability that if anything has the made in the USA label, it is made in the prison system. So we can look at some places that uh, use prison labor, Walmart, Starbucks, Victoria's Secret, a lot of our fruit, food production and food packaging, uh, military gear, uh, military uniforms, even in Wisconsin. Uh, a lot of universities do this and UW system does this too and actually has a requirement of using prison labor for university furniture. Uh, dentures are made, auto parts, even telemarketing and call centers. So you may get be solicited by somebody to, who is actually uh, in prison. And so we see this as we're still using prison labor. And this is not just through private prisons. This is something I just really thought recently like discovered that it's not just private prisons, but it's also federal prisons that are using uh, a, a huge portion. Actually, pr uh, federal prisons are using more uh, prison labor than uh, private prisons. Uh, California, 30% uh, of California firefighters are prisoners. Uh, just recently, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom just signed in which they are allowed to get jobs as firefighters once they are out of prison, because prior to that, they were not allowed to, receive, to uh, get jobs out of, fire, uh, out of prison. And so what I want you to think about is a correlation between you see here to the left, you see the slave overseer watching the slaves toil at work. And then you see these men right here lined up in the chain gang in the 1930s, in the 1920s, in the uh, late 18th and early 19th centuries. Uh, and then you also see right here, and this is a picture of Angola prison in Louisiana. Angola prison was a former plantation and it is one of the largest prisons in the United States. So another thing, one last thing real quick is that deindustrialization, uh, there's been a boom of prisons being built in the United States and that has a correlation with deindustrialization as, as factories started uh, declining in the United States, uh, prisons become a new form of an industry of building the prisons, uh, having uh, uh, workers in prisons, um, having products made in prisons. So, uh, you have mass incarceration. What does it do? It reinforces racial notions of black and brown criminality. It exploits cheap labor for capitalist gains. It's an unfair justice system. And we, in some communities, have created a financial dependence on uh, prison. And some businesses have def uh, uh, relied on uh, financial dependence on prison labor. 
And so here are some sources that you can look at. Uh, as it's recorded, you can come back and take a look. Uh, and here's some websites. Uh, so just want to say thank you. And I will pass it over to Annette. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. King. While Dr. Coleman is pulling up her slides, I just want to remind everybody that if you have a question, please put it in the chat um, anytime throughout any of the presentations. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. King. Um, I want to continue there and um, talk about the impact of mass, in mass incarceration not only on the individuals, but here now also on families and children. So as we heard here, one in four prisoners in the world is in a US prison. For women, that means one in three prisoners, uh, female prisoners in the world is in a, in a US prison. But this is not equally distributed. So today, African-Americans make up 14% uh, of the population, but they represent 40% of the prisoners. That is six times the incarceration rate of whites. The incarceration rate of women um, increased over 800% over the last 40 years. The rate of black women is twice as high as that of white women. Over half of all Americans, so 64%, have had an immediate family member imprisoned. So at some point. African Americans are 50% even more likely than that, um, than white adults to have a family member incarcerated. They are three times more likely to have a loved one locked up for over a year so they get longer prison sentences. Half of the prisoners in state prisons are incarcerated for nonviolent crimes. An international comparison can maybe show more how extreme the rate is for the United States. So the US has by far the highest incarceration rate in the world. So even compared to countries that we see as really oppressive dictatorships like Russia or Turkey, so the US still has a much higher incarceration rate. Uh, even when we compare it with our peers, we see that uh, the United States has um, five times the incarceration rate of the United Kingdom, um, six times the incarceration rate of Canada, and nine times the incarceration rate of Germany. So we have to ask, why is the incarceration rate in the United States so extreme uh, compared to its peers? And why is it so concentrated in the communities of color? For our presentation here today, we want to focus on one small element of that and to ask of how this extreme level of incarceration impact the affected communities, families, and the way children grow up and to ask if the circumstances in such communities themselves in turn contribute to these high levels of incarceration among its members. So we are talking about communities with high levels of poverty. Um, the reasons for that poverty are in part uh, those that Dr. King just described. Uh, so the history of racist policies changes in the structure of the economy that affect minority populations in different ways than it does whites or middle-class communities, but also that a majority of the men are present, are not present, no, that the majority of the men that are present are not employable because they are felony records. We saw the difficulties of getting a job interview even, or this large number of young men who are not present, who are in prison. That means women have limited choices for marriageable partners. It means high rates of single parents, single parent families, um, a lack of male role models, and the loss of benefits. So we are talking about poor, poor communities, but for any drug conviction, a person is not eligible to look for low income housing, cash benefits or food stamps. 
also with this high level of women that are incarcerated, that means that many children are not cared for by their mothers. So 75% of all incarcerated women in this country are mothers. 52% of all the incarcerated men have children. Poverty means the stress on the family. The contextual fa factors of such poverty means a lack of education, higher levels of drug use, violence, illness, mental illness. So that's not associated with minority uh, communities, but with the poverty. When men are imp imprisoned, the women, uh, the mothers take care of the children. But what happens when women are incarcerated? Usually that means a dissolution of the families. Um, when the children are lucky, they may have grandparents that take care of them. But in many instances, they are taken to foster care where there's a high rate of neglect and abuse. And the parents lose parental rights. So if a mother is incarcerated for more than 15 months out of the previous 22 months, she loses the rights to be a parent to her children. About more than 2.7 million children in the United States have a currently incarcerated parent. This number is so high, but still it is unequally distributed. When we look at this means one in 28 children, but at the same time, it means one in nine African-American children in contrast to one in 57 white kids. Overall, there's about 10 million children who have experienced the incarceration of a parent at one point in their lives. And such an experience of having a parent incarcerated is a major turning point in a child's life. It means long-term and traumatic consequences for physical and mental health and effects. And effects. Uh, the risk level of their own criminal behavior, so um, children with an incarcerated parent have a five times greater likelihood of becoming incarcerated themselves. Uh, they have lower educational attainment, their future earnings are lower, and they have more problems with intimate relationships. Now we have to imagine what is it like in a community where most of the children are affected in this manner. So when parental incarceration means family separation, interrupted attachment, stigmatization, poverty, foster care, uh, adverse situation in the school system, as we will hear in the next presentation by Dr. Heslauer, children grow up in stressed environment, in stressed communities and families. Studies have now proven a close connection between stressful childhood experiences and problems with physical, mental, and emotional health later in life. So the empirical efforts of wrapping our empirical hands around these issues uh, is called ACE. So it's an abbreviation for adverse childhood experiences. Uh, in the 1980s, there was an accidental discovery between, by a health insurance company between obesity and childhood sexual abuse. Further studies showed then a high correlation between family risk factors and major health problems such as heart disease, lung cancer, uh, um, cancer lung disease, diabetes, uh, major mental health problems, uh, including drug and alcohol abuse promiscuity, depression, and so forth. So we can prove an intersection of stressful individual family experiences and contextual factors of community conditions regarding maladaptation, physical and mental health problems, delinquency, and crime. So adverse childhood experiences or ACE can assess these experiences. Each type of experience as one score. The A score in the US population is rather high. 
the score among minority and poor people is really staggering. A scores among the incarcerated population is particularly high. So here are these um, types of ACE scores. So different types of abuse, each of these in each instance of such an abuse um, will count as one score. Uh, emotional neglect, physical neglect, mental illness of a parent, uh, observing domestic violence, uh, drug and alcohol use in the home, parental and incarceration in itself represents an A score. Uh, parental separation is another one. And this triangle illustrates the connection here of these adverse childhood experiences with impacts on the social, emotional, cognitive development of children, uh, the adoption of more uh, higher levels of high risk, uh, health risk behaviors, disease, disability, social problems, and then also earlier death. So we have to acknowledge here a vicious circle. An assessment of these incarceration data and of the A scores shows that this extreme level of incarceration exists nationally, that poor African American communities are disproportionately affected by it, and that this incarceration rate cannot be attributed to individuals and individual behavior alone. We have to acknowledge the deep and lasting impact of history of poverty, of parental incarceration of children and their upbringing. And we have to recognize that these circumstances in turn contribute to these incarceration rates. So here are some um, resources. Um, if you want more, let me know. But this is there are some TED Talks, an article, and a book to start. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Appreciate it. A reminder once again is Dr. Haslauer sets up her uh, presentation to put your questions in the chat. All right, Dr. Haslauer. All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for being here. So I am going to talk today about the school to prison pipeline. I have in particular uh, two agenda. One of them is for you to understand what the school to prison pipeline is. And then I would like to share with you four possible causes and solutions for that problem. So uh, as you saw before, we know that, in, and you heard in the previous two presentations, you know that in the United States, we incarcerate way more people than anywhere else in the world. But we also have to point out the disparity. And these both charts are about youth incarceration. In the second chart, you can actually see that way more children of color are incarcerated than their white counterparts. And what's really problematic is for us living in Wisconsin that we are one of those leading states. So what is the school to prison pipeline? It's kind of compli complicated, but uh, you can basically uh, boil it down to a couple issues. One of them is that typically those students who enter the juvenile justice system are poor academic achievers. Many of them are illiterate. They have not graduated in high school. And then also have a history of suspension or expulsion from schools. So basically, children are not um, achieving well in schools. They end up in the prison. What's also problematic with the school to prison pipeline, looking at a bigger context of race, is that we also know that low academic achievement and high suspension rate is much higher among children of color. So we are going to look at why, why are those? But before we actually get there, just a couple more uh, data for you to demonstrate how problematic the low academic achievement is among children of color. This is Wisconsin data, very recent 2019 cohort. You can see that 28% of black children in Wisconsin are not completing a high school education. Now, 
One of the other thing I would like to point out is American Indian students. One out of five American Indian students don't complete high school either. And this is important because in Wisconsin, we have 11 tribes. And so um, we have to keep that in mind as well. In terms of the uh, suspension rate, I would like to show you this chart. This is now a US context. Look at that. In the United States, African-American students make up 16% of all the enrollment. But if you're looking at the out of school suspension, almost half of them are African-Americans. So you can see here a huge disproportionality. We see the same thing with arrest and so forth. Uh, most importantly, or more importantly, these disparities start in preschool. So we are looking at here three and four year old students, children, and they are already suspended in schools. Look at the discrepancy again. Among the overall enrollment, 18% of all preschool children are African American. But when you're looking at the out of school suspension rates, almost half of them are African American. We have to ask the question why? Why is that African American children are suspended at a much higher rate than any other groups? You also have to question, you know, something about child development that what can a three or a four year old do that make them to be suspended from schools in the first place, right? Going back to Wisconsin data, expulsion by race and ethnicity in the 2018-2019 school year, you can see here, now those are absolute numbers, 294 uh, black children were expelled from schools in comparison to 267 white children. Um, so in, compa in comparison, 41% uh, of all the children who were expelled were black children. But then again, we cannot forget that only 9% of the school population in Wisconsin is black. Why? And if you compare that with the national data, we are actually doing worse um, because uh, in nationally, we have about 16% of the school population is black. Actually, before I go any further, I want to show you, uh, there are more um, uh, graphs in this PowerPoint hidden and uh, I can share that with you, but um, if you upload this PowerPoint, you're also going to see that girls and uh, black girls in particular, American Indians uh, are affected by that, and also students with disability. Black and Latina, La, uh, Latinx uh, children with disabilities are very highly um, res, um, representing that uh, group as well. So I would like to spend a lot of time on why. So we know the school to prison pipeline, we have to look, and we also know that black, of ch black children, children of color are affected in a higher uh, degree. We have to ask then, what is the reason that black children are um, achieving lower academically than their white counterparts? We also have to ask the question is why is that black children are expelled from schools from a higher degree than the other groups? And so we will explain, explore that. The first explanation is stereotypes and implicit bias. If you attended the last um, event, uh, Dr. Zilota talked about stereotypes and how the black male stereotypes was created over the centuries. What is implicit bias? Implicit bias is that if you live in a society where those stereotypes are very strong, it is likely that you internalize and you start to believe in those stereotypes without even knowing about them. Think about it. The um, United States teacher population is mostly white, have very little encounter with uh, the black groups. So they are relying mostly on those stereotypes. And as a result, it is very easy to see that implicit biases are affecting the ways they are looking at these children. From research, we know that children of color experience much lower academic expectations than other groups. We also know that teachers place African-American children in much higher degree to special education and low ability groups. But it's also striking 
that in um, those special education placements and durability placements, only the teacher's subjective opinion counts. So we don't have ob objective measures. It's basically the teacher's referral uh, decides whether the child will go into special education or lower ability groups. In terms of implicit bias, uh, it also can explain the high suspension rates among black children. We have to ask the question that is that really true that black children in preschool uh, behave worse than their white counterparts? And I want to share here with you a quote from Oluo. Uh, she published a book, So You Want to Talk About Race, and she has a whole chapter about school to prison pipeline. And this is what she writes. The biggest tragedy is to me the loss of childhood joy. Our kids do not get to be kids. Our kids do not get to be rambunctious. They do not get to be exuberant. They do not get to be defiant. Because if they do, this get them expelled or locked away. Now, luckily, we have a solution for implicit biases and that is called culturally responsive teaching. We know that when the teacher realizes the implicit biases, we know when the teacher realizes systemic inequities that uh, students of color are facing, we know that these things can be turned around, right? We know that if the school is created so that the school curriculum address the needs of black children, we know that black children can actually achieve very well in schools. And I would like to give you an example for you just how much disconnect there can be in the school curriculum. Think about a scenario where you are a white individual and you go in a school and in the school you have only black teachers. All your school administrators are black. Most of the students are black. Only a handful of white students are in that school. You open a textbook and everybody in the textbook is black. You are learning about black history and so forth. You might bring in a poem, you might bring in examples and nobody understands you, right? The question we have to ask is like, how motivated would you be to be engaged in that with that curriculum. Never mind if you would get the message that um, you have um, you cannot learn. There will be a very low expectation about you. Never mind if you would look at all the AP classes and you would see only black children in those groups, and you're looking at those who are being expelled from schools and they are white. Okay? So if you would be in a situation like that, how motivated you would be to study? So culturally responsive uh, practices source try to counteract or counteract all this. And basically the teacher realizes that in the schools, black children are often marginalized. And they try to create a curriculum that is relevant for children of color, for minority and other children from minority groups. Very important also not to have a deficit perspective about the students and the families. All right, uh, I also would like to show you another research that was done with Beverly Tatum. And uh, she actually write that yes, often and sometimes uh, black children would act out in schools. But this is not because they are mean or bad, but because they are reacting. They are reacting to a school environment in which they don't feel home, in which they don't feel to belong. And she calls that opposition and racial identity. So basically, children are opposing everything that is right. They, right. they perceive education as white, something that white folks do. And so are, they are opposing them, and they are actually refusing to be involved in the curriculum. But Beverly Tatum also said that if there is culturally responsive teaching, those children very quickly realize that the education is important and the education actually can empower them and they can, uh, that, and they can improve their future. And she calls that emissary racial identity. So in that way, the schools can do a lot um, to basically cut that academic achievement gap. The second thing I would like to point out why children of color are achieving lower in schools is the academic opportunity gap. 
Why in the world are we surprised that black children, children of color, who are oftentimes coming from poverty, uh, achieving less than their white counterparts when they are attending schools that is majorly underfunded? Why are we surprised then that those children are not achieving well in schools when they don't have qualified teachers? Think about Teach for America. In those high poverty schools that serves mostly black and brown children, you don't have qualified teachers, but what do you have? You have 22 year old college uh, students with college degrees who are not teachers. And basically they are placed in those classrooms and go ahead, try your best. By the time those young men and women figured out how to teach, they typically leave the classroom. It's a very nice intentional program, but the problem is with it that um, we need to have qualified teachers in those classrooms. In Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, for example, school district allowed, allowed student teachers in the classroom. Last year, I had a student, a wonderful student, who basically did his student teaching experience in a classroom and he was given a classroom. He, he, he took on and put all the responsibilities of a teacher and he was not qualified to do that. Good intention, absolutely. He was a wonderful, talented individual. But do we really want our children to be taught by 22 year olds who, are not, who don't even have a teaching degree? The third reason that creates, especially to, ex, uh, tell, uh, to suspension, is the presence of school resource officers in schools. Initially, the school resource officers were employed so that they create a positive relationship with the student. But we know that it is not the case. More often than not, um, police in schools do what they were trained to do, and that is arrest children, handcuff them. And we heard those stories in the news. Now, the police presence in school is dramatic for children's experiences because we know that in those schools that have an SRO on staff, children are five times more likely to be arrested for disorderly conduct. And so we have here the school to prison pipeline because these kids are going to end up in the juvenile justice system. We also know the children of color are way more likely to be in schools that is on SRO. And we also know that the police presence in the school does not do any good. It does not improve school safety nor behavior outcomes. Instead of protecting students, typically police uh, criminalizes children and they uh, push students out from the school system. What's important here is even for minor offenses. In the United States, we have 14 million students who are in a school with a police, but no counselor, no nurse or psychologist. And to put that into perspective, in the United States, we have 50 million students. Now, um, what is the alternative? Presence of school counselor healthcare providers would work much better. We also know from studies that if the school has a school counselor, social worker, et cetera, in school, it does improve the attendance rate. It does improve the academic achievement of the students. It lowers the number of suspensions and then also uh, other disciplinary incidents and improves overall safety issues. The fourth reason for the high um, or this pri uh, prison, school to prison pipeline is zero tolerance policies. Zero tolerance policies came into existence because of the Gun Free School Act of 1994. As a result of that, many states implemented disturbing school laws. It had a very broad interpretation. So even if you did something obnoxious, uh, you could be suspended from schools and this obnoxious was not uh, defined. So basically everything wrong. As a zero tolerance policies when they implemented, the reason for that was to punish the small incidents, and so it will prevent the big issues, but we know that it has not been the case. I will uh, skip that. Um, uh, so what would be an alternative to zero tolerance policies? We know that restorative justice programs work. Why? 
because it solves, it helps students to pro, uh, solve problems instead of criminalizing them. If the child displays a behavior problem, the children is going to explain what she or he did, what was the causes, and helps the child to improve the behavior. It gives them tools um, to improve. We also know that, uh, as Dr. Kuhlman talked um, before about adverse childhood experiences and traumas, many of the children who come from um, high poverty areas experience adverse childhood experience, uh, um, adverse traumas, and the least thing what they need is to re-traumatizing them by expelling them from school because of the zero tolerance policy. What they really need is help so that they can actually deal with the traumas that they have and those traumas that result later in behavior problems. So re restorative justice programs send a very different message than zero tolerance policies and SROs in school. That is telling children, you are a good person. Yes, you might have done something wrong, but you can improve. And we want you in the school, we want you to be successful. It has an interventionist approach. On the other hand, if you're looking at zero tolerance policies and uh, school resource officers, what do they do? They basically punish the children, remove them from the schools. There's a social exclusion component. And we know again that if once the, cho the child was suspended from school, it, they will have much higher likelihood to go into the prison system. And at the end, I want to ask you the question is, do we believe that our children are our future? We tend to believe that. But do we also believe that about black and brown children? How do we think about our children of color? Do we think about us, they are assets of the society and we do everything so that they can be a productive member of this society? Are we going to invest them, not in the prison system, but more in the education? Or are we going to continue seeing them in criminals in making. That's all what I have. Thank you, Dr. Hoslauer. Um, I'm starting to get some questions here in the chat. So we have a few minutes here. So if you guys want to hang on, I think I've got at least one for each of you. So I'm going to start with you, Dr. King. I've got something from the chat. Um, I'm understanding the statistics amongst African Americans in comparison to Anglo populations. Do those numbers include Latino communities being impacted by mass incarceration as well? Um, I think that some of my uh, images had uh, the numbers of Latinos, uh, Latinx groups being incarcerated at a higher rate than whites, a little slightly less than uh, blacks, but they are still disproportionately incarcerated at a higher rate uh, than their population. And that has to do with a lot of heavily policing in com Latinx communities. Uh, one of the fastest growing groups of uh, prisoners are uh, uh, immigrant groups. So uh, they're using uh, immigrant groups to arrest and detain and oftentimes using their labor as well. So it's not uh, the deportation processes as much. Uh, so they are being detained and imported, or not deported, but also their labor is being used in, in a lot of prisons. So there are some uh, correlations of, of seeing undocumented immigrants being incarcerated and being counted as that also. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Coleman, next question is for you. What are some ways that you can minimize the impact of ACE scores in children? It is interesting of how the Black Lives Matter movement is demanding defunding police. And usually we don't hear about that. Instead, they want to see more funding for social services. So that's a good example for what we're talking about. So um, poverty is not being helped by increased incarceration. There is a need for um, more jobs. There is a need for a better education and more sensitive education as we just heard about. That's another big part. So other kind of social support system, uh, support system for single mothers as well and support systems that strengthen the community. So those factors 
would uh, really make a difference. Where then ways that these kind of um, stresses and the trauma that these children experience can be acknowledged. Uh, we tend to not really want to see of how uh, intense the impact of things like divorce or in parental incarceration or parental um, um, mental health issues are on children. Thank you. Yep, Dr. Hauslauer, uh, Emily from UW Richland says, I'm going into education and as a future teacher, what can I do to stop the school to prison pipeline at a kindergarten level? Is it wrong to wanna to work in an underfunded black school? I feel like it could be white savior like. What's your response to that? Mm -hmm. So what I would say to teachers is that, and, and the reason why I started out with the implicit bias, because I do believe that this is the biggest issue. If we can put all the money into the school district, it's not gonna have. I think teachers have to realize their implicit biases. And I am not saying that teachers are mean or teachers are bad or teachers are racist or anything like that. But teachers need to realize that we live in a society that those stereotypes are out there. We are not living in a vacuum. We are absorbing them. Many white teachers never had the chance to go into a black community. Many, many white teachers don't have a personal contacts with people of color. They don't know the communities and so forth. So where do we get our information? We get it from the media. And that's oftentimes is not very uh, positive about people of color. So I think that this is the very first step for teachers to understand and to recognize that, you know what? I have implicit biases very likely. And those implicit biases are going to affect the way I'm looking at the children. And I think when teachers are willing to do that, and I think that this is, this is, this is very hard and this is, very difficult because it's almost like, okay, so are you saying I'm racist? And no, absolutely I don't. But I think once we, um, we recognize that, then I think we have a very, very good first step. Uh, Dr. King, I'm gonna collapse a couple student questions into one because they seem along a similar theme. Um, solutions to mass incarceration. Um, how can we lower those incarceration rates by using, by mimicking other countries with harm reduction programs? Um, this is from Dakota Ewing, who's a freshman FI major. Yeah, Dr. Kuhlman and I were talking about this one time uh, regarding uh, the example in Europe. So uh, when it comes to incarceration in Europe, uh, there's been an example of uh, wardens and prison guards going from South Dakota that went to uh, uh, Germany and other countries, and they looked at their model, particularly Norway, and they were devastated of how cruel our processes are of incarceration compared to uh, those countries in which they're uh, done in a way of rehabilitating and not necessarily a punishment. Uh, our, our, our prison system... We, pr we try to say that we are a uh, rehabilitative process, and this is something that criminologists have been arguing for, for years, uh, but we are essentially a, a punitive type of institution. I think one of the big things is the uh, kind of like with my, my associates and my colleagues were saying is that our education system needs to change our um, our economic system needs to be changing and our entire structure. Uh, so we need to look at unjust laws and look at the racial disparity of these laws, look at the the uh, whether these laws are actually keeping us safe or whether they're just designed to uh, incarcerate more people. I think the, the war on drugs may be something that we can do and address and, and, and attack. But I also think that we need to uh, come up with ways in which we can uh, restructure our way of uh, incarceration and whether we should even be doing incarceration. There are some people out there uh, that have been around even before uh, police abolitionists or defunding the police when they were saying that uh, 
the prison, our prison system is really doesn't do anything. It just creates recidivism and it's, uh, it's very flawed and they want to abolish our prison system altogether. Uh, so other folks want to try to do a model of Europe uh, through Europe and see what they are doing uh, because uh, the, the punishments are not harsh. The, the lack of recidivism rates are much, much lower. And recidivism just means repeat offending is much, much lower than what we're doing in the United States. And so that correlates with a possibility of in the United States that our prison system uh, is ha inherently racist and the cruelty behind that uh, is the history of how racism has played in the United States. Thank you. Thanks. I want to be mindful of everybody's time. I know it is seven o'clock. Um, I do have a couple more questions in the chat. So if folks want to hang around and if it's okay with the panel, we can answer a few more questions. Um, I promise not to go much past 10 after seven. Okay. Um, uh, two questions that both have to do with ways to think about lowering or eliminating prison labor. Any thoughts from the panel on that? On how that can be done? Well, what was the question? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear it. Oh, sorry. Um, ways to lower or eliminate prison labor. If I can jump in and respond to or continue what Dr. King was saying. Um, one couple of reasons why the incarceration rate is so much lower, especially in, in Western Europe, is, is not only is there not a war on drugs, in many of the countries, um, drug use is not uh, an enforceable crime. So especially for marijuana offenses, you would not go to prison. In some countries like Portugal, you don't go at all to prison for uh, if you are a drug addict and you are selling only enough drugs that would support your own um, addiction, which is about drug use for about uh, 10 days. So if you get caught with drugs, not more than what it would take a user for 10 days, you will not go to prison for it. Um, in Germany, you will have drug counseling is in, immediately associated with uh, your sentence. And as an outpatient counseling, it will be part of your sentence, but you would not be incarcerated while you are undergoing the counseling. In uh, Germany, too many nonviolent crimes, uh, you have to pay a fine that's based on your daily income, but you don't go to prison for it. So as I referenced before, a lot of the people, nearly half of the people in state prisons are incarcerated for nonviolent crimes and they are often drug related. Thank you for that follow up, Dr. Kuhlman. Um, I'm gonna circle back around to the question of how to, ways to lower or eliminate prison labor and what people can do with regards to that. Um, I think one of the big things is awareness. I don't think people are aware of how our um, prison system is capitalizing on utilizing that labor. Uh, I know that possibly one of the major things that we can do is uh, from the state and, and federal level is to uh, call for that and, and voting for political figures that can uh, address this and really show the exploitation of, of prisoners and uh, their labor and also show that it's a continuation of our American history of slavery. Uh, I think that uh, pr uh, reducing the number of people in prison, uh, but there's oftentimes a correlation with some states in which they sign contracts with prisons, particularly private prisons, in which they have to have a certain percentage of host, uh, prison bids actually housed. In which, so the state has to go out and try to arrest people just to fill up those prisons uh, because they have contracts with the state. So it's a multi-billion dollar business. Uh, I, if I had a solution, I would be a very wealthy person, I guess, because I would come up with that solution, but it's, it's very difficult to, to do. It's just that we need to understand how flawed our criminal justice system actually is. 
Thank you, Dr. King. One quick way would be to, to pay prisoners a living wage while they are in prison for their labor so that they would not be cheaper labor than the uh, people that are working in industries outside of prison. And then they have money when they get out of prison that they can have a new start. Thank you. Um, last question is going to go to Dr. Haslauer. Um, in talking about culturally responsive teaching practices, I seem to only hear about those with regards to racial differences. Can you use culturally responsive teaching practices in other ways that don't focus on racial differences? Oh my gosh, absolutely, absolutely. So basically, culturally responsive teaching means that you understand who you teach. Culturally responsive teaching means if I'm a teacher from New York City and I come to the rural Wisconsin, culturally responsive teaching means that I understand the community, I understand the teacher, how the children learn, what are the background information, I respect what they know, I respect the families, I respect their strength. If I work with students who come from poverty, again, looking at the family's um, knowledge, um, every family has a wealth of knowledge, right? Looking at them not as uh, failures or deficits, but trying to find their strength, to connect with the parents, to understand what the parents want from their children, to have high expectations, because oftentimes we don't have high expectations from children who are poor either. So absolutely, it goes with um, um, all, all sorts of minoritized groups, immigration, including hetero, then also heterosexism. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everybody. I wish we could sit here and do this all night, but I want to thank everybody um, for participating tonight. I especially want to thank our three presenters, Dr. King, Dr. Coleman, and Dr. Haslauer for their time and for sharing their knowledge on this subject. I'm going to remind you that this has been recorded. And so if you'd like a copy of this, uh, make sure you get in touch with Travis Nelson. And also I want to make sure I invite you to the next forum, which is October 21st at 6, uh, which we'll be talking about race and policing. So thank you all for coming and have a great night.